Our founding members used a new device. This device was the scientific method, a product of the enlightenment of Europe and the foundation of all scientific discoveries. In the scientific method, one formulates a hypothesis, designs an experiment to test the hypothesis, analyzes the results, and puts a statement of likelihood on whether the hypothesis is true or false. This method is now commonplace, but in 1908 it was new. Our society is linked with the land-grant idea that revolutionized American agriculture. In 1862, during the depths of our Civil War, Abraham Lincoln signed the Morrill Act, using the coinage at the time of land grants to establish an agricultural and mechanical college in each state. There were no agriculture teachers. It was not yet an academic discipline. After the land-grant colleges were established, an attempt was made to incorporate ideas from the revolution in British agriculture, the pedigree breeding system that produced British breeds of livestock came to stay. Then Congress passed the Hatch Act in 1887. Government put science to work for agriculture, and the colleges started to succeed. Farmers began to feel that the college man must know something and had ways of learning things the scientific method not possessed by the man on the farm. The last of the land-grant triad was the Smith-Lever Act which was passed in 1914 and organized the Cooperative Extension Service in the United States. The extension agents lived with the people and were to interpret and take research results directly to the producer. In 1908, the American Society of Animal Nutrition was formed at Cornell University. In 1915, the society changed its name to the American Society of Animal Production to include other disciplines. In 1961, the name was changed to the American Society of Animal Science. The society published proceedings early and started publishing the Journal of Animal Science in 1942. The annual meetings were held at the time of the International Livestock Exposition around Thanksgiving. They were held in the old Sherman House in Chicago from 1920 to 1963, after which they were moved to university campuses and later still in 1994 to convention centers. We have broadened our scope of cooperation with other organizations. ASAS and Dairy Science have held joint meetings since 1978 except when we met with the Canadian Society in 1982. In 1987, ASAS appointed an executive vice president to represent us in Washington, D.C. In 1989, we participated with dairy science and poultry science to create an organization now known as the Federation of Animal Science Societies, FASS, with offices in Savoy, Illinois to serve all of the organizations. We have also worked with the European and World Associations. So what has ASAS given its members over the years? It has provided a venue where members come and present a paper, listen to the presentations of other researchers, discuss mutual problems and learn from colleagues, find a job or hire a young researcher, and make or renew friendships. During the 30 plus years we met at universities, attendees could enjoy the unique attributes of a campus and the state with friends and family at the annual picnic. Our Journal of Animal Science has provided scientists a means to disseminate their peer-reviewed research results and exchange ideas. But most of all, we could share and learn from our colleagues. These are the gifts of our society. 
Numerous members of ASAS have been prominent livestock judges. Within the 20th century, there were many type changes in the species, and the show ring played a role. However, breeders can now use genetic predictions for selection, but stock shows still have many reasons for being. The important findings of our members are often found in thesis projects, and the California Net Energy System came from a thesis by Garrett, later president of ASAS, under the direction of Lofgreen and Meyer at UC Davis. The goal of this project was to determine, in a comparative way, the energy requirements of cattle and sheep for maintenance and growth. Two fundamental principles of animal physiology were used, which provided a more accurate assessment of utilization of different feeds and allowed better decisions to be made regarding feeding and management alternatives. The net energy system replaced the expression of an animal's energy requirements with two energy values for each feedstuff, maintenance and growth. The net energy system has been used in computer programs for developing least cost diets and other management models. Perhaps of greater importance has been the catalytic effect of this work in stimulating research in companion areas. One of the most significant events of the 20th century was the proprietary use of inbred lines of corn to produce hybrid corn. In 1925, Henry A. Wallace took the work of Shaw, East, and Jones on hybrid corn conducted at the Connecticut Station and started the Pioneer Hybrid Seed Corn Company. Within 10 years, hybrid corn blanketed the corn belt. This corn had real heterosis and was more uniform. Abundant, cheap corn was widely used in the livestock industry. After 1953, corn was increasingly used in the feedlot finishing of beef cattle. In dairy cattle, grain feeding has contributed to milk production, and both swine and poultry are fed corn. One result of the success of hybrid corn was the animal breeders were encouraged to emulate that success by creating and crossing inbred lines of livestock species. In 1946, the Research and Marketing Act allowed for regional projects for each species. These projects were modeled on the successful Regional Swine Breeding Laboratory established in 1937 under Kraft. The annual yeasty meetings advanced the animal breeding field, and many projects were initiated by the states to develop inbred lines and evaluate them in crosses. Most lines were failures. Only a few beef lines contributed. Swine breeding followed the same path, and in 1954, Dickerson evaluated 47 inbred lines created by states and found none useful. Today, we have difficulty realizing the influence that the beef breed associations had in wanting high-grade commercial stock. It was not until the late 1950s that rebellious states began publishing results on crossing breeds. Luckily, heterosis was revealed in reproduction and growth rates such that a 20% advantage resulted from the use of a bull of a third breed on crossbred cows. In the southern states, crossing Brahmin cattle with British breeds greatly improved production based on the adaptability of the Brahmins to the subtropical environment. In 1968, cattle from Europe began to be imported via Canada. The objective of the Germ Plasm Evaluation Project of the U.S. MARC was to characterize a broad sample of breeds representing diverse biological types for bioeconomic traits. This was one of the most anticipated studies by breeders 
since they had a financial stake and were used immediately. Although some of the larger continental breeds had advantages and now contribute to U.S. beef production, the British breeds continue. Extensive crossbreeding studies have been conducted in swine with good results. Today, swine breeding is a commercial enterprise. Roughly 75% of the seed stock used for swine production comes from swine breeding companies. It is like poultry. One hallmark of our society during the 20th century was that results of scientists from diverse disciplines came together to produce synergistic results. Such occurred across many disciplines, but here is a good example. Population genetics was allied to the Mendelian genetics by Fisher's paper of 1918, which allowed a genetic interpretation of the correlation among relatives. With this idea, heritability, or the fraction of the variance due to heredity, was used to evaluate its importance in numerous traits. But before this could be used, the codification of records of economic relevance was necessary. The computer age opened new opportunities to obtain genetic evaluations of individuals for selection. Much was accomplished in 1960 by Harvey's analysis of data with unequal subclass numbers, which resulted in many published papers. Then Henderson introduced a mixed model, Best Linear Unbiased Prediction, or BLUP, in the late 1960s. Beginning in 1971, the BLUP model was used to analyze data. The use of faster and larger computers and improved statistical procedures allowed ever larger data sets and more inclusive models to be used. The last facet of this synergism is the most important. This is the advance of artificial insemination. The introduction of frozen semen in 1952 assisted genetic prediction by spreading progeny from sires across several herds. A solid theory records of performance, advances in computer abilities, and the use of artificial insemination have worked together to enhance the rate of genetic change in livestock. Such synergism has benefited many areas of animal science. Many of our members have developed practical tools and field-altering advances the first was S.M. Babcock of Wisconsin, who in 1890 measured butter fat in milk and later introduced the idea of purified diets, which in turn allowed biochemists at Wisconsin to begin a long line of vitamin discovery. The second was Ellen Hazel of Iowa, who set up a system of equations to select for several traits using an index. Henderson, one of Hazel's students, went on to refine the concept and later to develop genetic predictions. Later, Hazel went to a research club meeting and a colleague asked him what he was working on. Hazel told him he needed to evaluate the carcasses of the live animals and the colleague asked if he had tried. After the meeting, Hazel bought a steel ruler for a dime and the mechanical back fat probe was born. This simple discovery was published in the Journal of Animal Science and helped initiate the swine testing stations. The old probe is now gone, having been replaced with ultrasound technology, which can be used on the live animal to evaluate marbling, the amount of fat in the lean. Federal beef grading using marbling to easily identify grain-fed versus grass-fed cattle was started in 1926 by our society's meat scientists. Understanding and controlling the reproductive system in male and female animals is imperative. Because the creation of new wealth or offspring is the most important trait Hormones control the system. Much of the work on male reproductive physiology came from researchers working in dairy. Semen studies led to new storage techniques. 
fertility measures, dilution methods, and packaging. Frozen semen was in general use by 1952, and it revolutionized artificial insemination as a tool for genetic gain and disease control. Dairy cattle are seen daily for estrus detection. This is not so for beef and swine. Endocrinology and the study of hormone control was crucial in unraveling the control mechanisms of estrus, ovulation, and maintenance of pregnancy and lactation. These studies revealed a beautifully evolved system. Estrus detection and the eventual control of the estrus cycle resulted in programs to synchronize reproduction. In most species, males are the sex on which selection operates because they can generate large numbers of progeny in a short period. Now, multiple ovulation embryo transfer schemes are being conducted that allow the use of selection in female cattle. Recent advances using sexed semen and cloning have allowed many aspects of the reproduction to be brought under control. J.A. Craig started the first animal husbandry department at Wisconsin in 1890. He introduced laboratory work in judging livestock, which made the field attractive to students. Most animal husbandry classes had judging labs. One reason for the emphasis on judging was that winning teams promoted the colleges. More and more, the courses became science-oriented because the new professors had graduate training in the sciences. This was satisfactory when students grew up with practical experience on the farm. But now, as more students from urban areas begin taking animal science courses, it may be necessary to reintroduce the more practical. Women now constitute more than 50% of the enrollment in most agriculture classes. Many textbooks have been prepared for classes, with the most famous being Types and Breeds of Farm Animals by C.S. Plum of Ohio State, published in 1906. In the 1970s, dial-up connections to mainframes gave access to agricultural decision aids. The 1980s saw the introduction of personal computers and PowerPoint. Spreadsheet programs became widely available and some departments added classes to teach about the potentials for computers in animal science. Extension education has come a long way during the 20th century. Livestock extension specialists once traveled to every corner of the state to present new information to producers. In spite of problems, extension continues to make important contributions today through good use of computers and modern communication tools to increase the effectiveness of their outreach. Animal agriculture has changed in part thanks to our members who have contributed new knowledge to animal science. Massive decentralization of the livestock markets and packing houses was a big change. The size of livestock operations has increased and their specialization toward a single species has occurred. Great strides have been made by our members in the feeding, breeding, control, and management of livestock. Animal scientists have met many challenges in the past century, but clearly much important work lies in the future. You should all be proud of the collective accomplishments of our society.